It is September 22nd, 1796. The day begins. Charles Lamb, as has been the case for the last many years, has to make his way from Seven Little Queen Street in Holborn, a section of London. He must make his way from there to his workplace, East India Company. He's an accountant there. His sister, 11 years his senior, Mary, has been acting very strangely over the past few days. She's under a lot of strain. She's taking care of their mother, Charles and Mary's mother, who is very ill. Uh, she has a lot of needs. Basically, Mary has to care for her 24 seven. The father, also, his health is poor. He's had a stroke recently and he is partially paralyzed. He too needs around the clock care. In addition, there is an aunt, the sister of Charles and Mary's father, um, one Aunt Sarah, she is there as well. Uh, she's not much help. She's not physically disabled, but she's of a rather cranky and eccentric disposition. And the mother and uh, Sarah do not get along. Another tension in the house. To help make ends meet for the family, um, Mary is a mantua maker. She makes very sophisticated dresses. This is painstaking labor, uh, many hours a day, doing very tedious work. She doesn't make much money for it. Mary's also uh, in charge of an apprentice who is helping her make dresses. So with all this stress, uh, Mary's starting to act strangely. She's especially agitated, nervous. Um, her movements are jerky. She lashes out in anger. She has shown these behaviors before in times of great stress. Well, Charles is making his way to work. He is 21 years old and he's looking as he makes his way for one Dr. Pitcairn. Uh, this is the family doctor. Uh, Charles knew Pitcairn very well. Charles himself, some six months earlier, had spent some time in a madhouse in Hoxton, um, an area of London. So, so Charles himself had what we would call a mental breakdown uh, to the point where he had to spend six months in an asylum. So mental health issues certainly run in the family. Charles can't find Dr. Pitcairn that morning, so he goes to work works his long day. He's an accountant for East India Company. And when he finally gets off work, he's making his way back home. And when he gets to the family dwelling, he notices the door is open. And he hears screams. So he rushes up the stairs into the room. And what does he see? There, in the middle of the room, slumped over in a chair, blood staining her chest, is Elizabeth. Charles and Mary's mother. Mary has grabbed in a fit of insanity a nearby kitchen knife and has stabbed her mother to death. Charles sees her with the knife still in her hand and it seems as though she's now going to make for the father who's cowering in the corner. Before she can, Charles lunges and jerks the knife from her hand. Probably almost instantaneously, Mary returned to her full rational faculties and realized what she had done and slumped over in tremendous sorrow. Charles knew he had to act fast. He knew that if the authorities came, Mary might be taken away and charged for murder and hung, or she may be taken in by the state and put into Bedlam Insane Asylum in London, which is almost worse than being hung. So horrific are the conditions there. So what does he do? He probably wraps her up in his coat, makes you a straitjacket, and maybe with the help of a landlord, um, gets her away from the scene and takes her to a private madhouse and there pays for her to be taken care of. So by the time the authorities arrive, she's gone. Now, this is a time in UK law when people who have mental health use issues are treated fairly generously. This is the time of King George III. King George III was himself insane by almost all accounts. And, and therefore the laws in place were kind to those who had mental health issues. So the authorities basically agreed to let Charles take care of his sister for the rest of his life. They said to him, if you agree to take care of her for the rest of her life, we will let that happen. So at the age of 21 years old, Charles basically says, I will be, in the, I will be the caretaker for my sister. 
And this probably meant, and Charles knew this, that he would never have a wife, never have a family. He had committed to a certain form of existence. Now, for the rest of his days, he had periodically to commit Mary to an insane asylum. When Mary was sane, she was rational, she was tranquil, she was eloquent, she was a, a, a great writer, a great social companion, she was fun at dinner parties. But when she would lose her wits, uh, she would become violent. Um, she might hallucinate, she might talk about things that aren't there, and she had to be put away as quickly as possible for her safety and the safety of those around her. So I mentioned this one moment, September 22nd, 1796, in Charles Lamb's life, this moment that he called the day of horrors. This is the defining moment of Charles's life. And it is one of many moments that have a dark effect on his existence. Taking care of Mary was a huge burden, even though the two got along beautifully in her saner moments. They were very, very close. It was a huge burden though, having to suffer being away from Mary, whom he loved intensely, or having to, to suffer dealing with Mary when she was having her fits and needing to be put into a sane asylum. Because of this, um, this need to put Mary in various private madhouses, um, the public one, Bedlam, being quite terrible, some of the private ones were too, Charles had um, to work long, grueling hours at East India Company, sometimes 10 or upward hours a day, six days a week. So he knew he would never have the kind of literary life of his good friend Coleridge um, and of Wordsworth, whom he would meet and befriend a little later on. So uh, the grinding job for the rest of his days, taking care of Mary for the rest of his days. And again, connected to this, knowing that he would probably never enjoy um, an ongoing romance or matrimony. He already, um, in 1792, when he was a fairly young man, um, was jilted probably by one Ann Simmons, um, a young woman who had, he had met in the country in Hertfordshire where his um, grandmother lived. Um, some say that she let him go because she was told that insanity runs in the Lamb family and she had best steer clear of him. So he's disappointed in love already before Mary even has her breakdown. But then in 1819, um, Charles proposes to a famous actress of the time, one Frances Kelly, uh, who was quite fond of Charles, but ultimately refused his proposal and later on made it clear to those close to her that one reason she did so is because she was afraid of living in the same house with Mary Lamb, afraid of Mary having a fit of insanity and becoming violent, also afraid of having to join in the caretaking of Mary when she was in an insane state. So I say these things to, to emphasize how, how grim the, the life of Charles Lamb was. It was, a, it was a grim, melancholy life. Charles dealt with the grimness several ways. One way, he drank a lot. He was most likely an alcoholic. Uh, two, he had a very active social life. He was famous at dinner parties for his puns and his wit. But one of the most powerful ways that he negotiated his dark life was in 1820 to create a, a literary persona, um, Elia, E-L-I-A, or Elia, um, one doesn't quite know how he wanted it pronounced, Elia, Elia. And this is a persona that Charles Lamb used to write his famous essays, the essays that he published in London Magazine starting in 1820 all the way up to about 1825. And these essays are whimsical, fanciful, wild, bizarre, baroque, crazy, hilarious, um, eccentric. They don't seem to come from the pen of a man with an extremely dark life. So this persona, Eliah, becomes a sort of release for Charles, where he can live out a playfulness and a freedom that he himself did not enjoy in his everyday life. So we have to get that, that there's an underlying irony to all of the comedy in the Eliah essays. It's comedy that comes from darkness. Um, there is a fringe of gloom around the crazed brightness of the Lambian wit.